<clears throat> yes, you were probably wondering, why is he still up there? That would include me. <laughs> but Jeremy asked me, and of course my first reaction was similar to uh, waking up and finding out it's the first day of school, that feeling. I didn't like school much. Actually, I did in grade school. Grade school was great, but once I hit puberty in, in you know, junior high, things went downhill from there. I, have, I don't have a lot of fond memories of school. Uh, but I thought, you know what? If God can use a donkey to speak his word to Balaam in the Old Testament, he can use me, <laughs> however, however feeble my lips might be. But uh, I just, I, I've been thinking about this all week, and I, I think it's what God laid on my heart. It's called Seeking God. And the, the key scripture is going to be Isaiah 55, 6, which says this. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. That verse always bothered me for a long time because I, I felt like, is God playing hide and seek? Seek him while he may be found. I thought it was strange. Call upon him while he's near. But the more I thought about it, I thought, you know, I think what it's saying is we can start out close to him. But there's a reason I sang one of the songs, the first song this morning, we, I've anchored in Jesus. If you're anchored in him, then you're going to be near. You don't have to worry about drifting away. I don't know a lot about boats, but I do know that if you're in the ocean or whatever, even if you're close to shore, if you're not anchored, the tide, currents, whatever, it could cause you to drift. If you're anchored in Jesus, you're going to be near to God. If you're not anchored, guess what? You could drift away, and many people have and are. So it didn't bother me so much anymore when I, when I read it in that way. I don't believe God's playing hide-and-seek with us. Um, hide-and-seek. That was one of my favorite games as a kid. Uh, used to go to Gary and Anna Marie's house, Craig, their son, and Julie, their daughter. Craig is only a couple years younger than me, and we, we were at each other's house all the time. And one of the games we liked to play at Craig's house was hide and seek in the dark. They had a basement, and uh, obviously the one who was seeking had a flashlight. The other two would go hide somewhere. There are lots of hiding places in that basement. When I think back, I think, it's kind of creepy. I was surprised that we weren't, we weren't afraid or anything, didn't think anything of it, of spiders or whatever else. But, um, so there were lots of good places to hide. One in particular I remember was a water heater right next to the stairs. And it had room on top of it. There weren't any pipes coming out of it or anything, so it was just flat. And you could sneak in there and just hide on top of that water heater. That was a great place to hide because the person come down the stairs, he's not thinking about that. He's going all out throughout the basement. Of course, once they found me, then you could never hide there again because that was the first place they would look. And if I remember right, was that an 80-gallon water heater? We had the same thing. It was about the size of a nuclear missile. <laughs> and I know that because when we finally got rid of ours, can you imagine heating 80 gallons of water, how long that took and how inefficient it was we finally got rid of ours where I lived and I had to help dad get it out of the basement I somehow used ropes and whatever because it, it was monstrous at any rate hide and seek was one of our favorite games but how would it have been if Craig and Julie went down to hide and I, I went and sat on the couch and uh, look around and said oh, I hope I find them pretty soon I mean, does that make sense? Obviously, I had to go seek for them. And God isn't any different. He expects us to seek him. He set up the rules. I didn't. He says to seek him. There's multiple verses about seeking him. And I only picked out a few. The next one is Deuteronomy 4.29. And in reality, this verse is a prophecy. Uh, Moses is prophesying about what's going to happen to Israel. This was about 1,600 years before it happened. Okay? But Moses is telling Israel, if you disobey, if you keep going the way you're going, God's going to scatter you among all the nations. 
guess what? Guess what happened in 70 AD when the temple was destroyed and Jerusalem destroyed? Actually, it was about 30 some years later when they were finally totally dispersed to all the nations on the earth. At any rate, um, let me get the right scripture here. So he prophesied, and, and this verse isn't up there, but I'll read it. The Lord will scatter you among the peoples, and you shall be left few in number among the nations where the Lord shall drive you. And then this verse. But from there, you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you search for him with all your heart and all your soul. That sounds conditional to me. You have to seek him with all your heart and all your soul. Not half-hearted, not sitting on the couch, well, I hope I find him. You've got to seek. Another one that's Jeremiah 29, 13 is another very good verse. And again, I, I, I didn't pick, there, there are many more that say the same thing. It's seeking. It's a, a theme with God. Seek me, seek me. Jeremiah 29, 13. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with what? All your heart. Not half-heartedly, but all your heart. And we have to ask ourselves, you know, am I seeking God with all my heart? I gotta ask myself that. Or am I distracted by the myriad of things that we have today, which, you know, years ago we didn't have, you know, people in the medieval days, they basically had to farm, make their food from dawn till dusk and then go to bed. Today, I mean, we have free time, we've got all the technology to, to uh, distract us. So we, we have to seek. We have to dig into the Word to find out what He wants. That's how He set it up. Atheists claim that there is no evidence for God whatsoever. None. It's irrational to believe in God. Really? <laughs> that evidence is everywhere. Let's read Romans 1, 18 through 25 and see what it says. This is one of my favorite chapters and verses in the whole Bible. Because I love logic. I love, and this, this, is, this talks about logic. <clears throat> Romans 1, beginning with verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools." and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them, for they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Boy, there's a lot of professing professors today that are fools. A lot of them. And what's the Bible definition of a fool? You ever wonder? Go to Psalm 14.1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have committed abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. And it's, it's very interesting. It's almost as if God was saying, in case you forgot, when you read through the Psalms, when you get to Psalm 53, it starts out the exact same way. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And it's interesting, it's, he says, in his heart. Could have just said, the fool has said, there is no God and left it at that. And I would have been okay with it, but God made it clear in his heart. The true fool is the one who Satan has convinced inside there is no God, no matter what common sense says. And there are many of them in the world, I'm afraid. 
you have to suspend logic to believe in atheism or evolution. You have to. There's no other way. Because to, to be an atheist is to believe there was nothing and nothing exploded and became everything. And, and they'll, they'll spout off and say, oh, you, you just don't understand science. What? That's not science. That's belief in magic. Nothing more. But that is their position. And they love to intimidate us and, make it, and mock us and make us feel like fools. And it's like, so you're saying, your belief is that nothing exploded and became everything, including life. Which, by the way, the law of biogenesis says life can only come from life. Life has never been proven to come from non-living material. Never. They used to believe it in the 1800s until Louis Pasteur. They, they thought flies spontaneously burst forth from, like, dead meat. Look, spontaneous generation. It proves it. Pasteur... Who was, a, who was a Christian, I believe. He's in, he's in one of the 50. I've got a book here called Show Me God, and he's one of the 50 scientists that is mentioned. And uh, Pastor says, that's crazy. So he did an experiment, a science experiment. Put some rotting meat in a jar, sealed the jar, observed it for days and days. Hey, lo and behold, no flies. But the science of the day said, oh, spontaneous generation. That's how life came about. That's foolishness. Did you know the word logic derives from the Greek logos? And if we read, I don't know if I gave you the scripture, John chapter 1, verse 1, a lot of you know how it goes. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Pretty profound. But you know what Greek, the Greek word for word is? Logos. Jesus is logos. And the, and the definition of logos, one of the definitions, is reason. It's reasonable to believe there is a creator and that he did what he said and, and put it down in his word. Atheists are desperate to find explanations that exclude God. I'm going to read some quotes uh, from some things that are, that are very thought-provoking from this book, Show Me God, which you can see is falling apart at the seams. I've read it quite a few times. Very good book. If you ever get the chance, it's written by a man named Fred Heron. Amazing book. Just wonderful stuff in here. But uh, you see, atheists used to believe in what they call a static universe which simply means an eternal universe that did away with that pesky need for a creation event. So they thought they had it made, yeah. It's, it's always existed, let's, let's, then we'll put forth our science from there. But 1927 came about, Edwin Hubble, you've heard of the Hubble Space Telescope? He discovered what, and I'm not gonna bore you with all the details, but he discovered red shifting in galaxies. In, in a nutshell, he discovered the universe expanding in all directions from a central creation event, which put them in a corner. If there's a creation event, you got two choices. The universe birthed itself from nothingness, or there's a creator outside of time and space that did it. There's your two. Einstein himself believed in the static uh, universe theory. And when he made his uh, theory of relativity, he put in what's called known as a cosmological fudge factor because something wasn't quite right. He didn't know what to make his theory work. And uh, it's interesting. Atheists love to, to quote Einstein in his beginning years because in essence he was an atheist or at least an agnostic. But they don't quote him after. And I'm not saying he became a Christian. I, I don't know if he ever came to faith in Jesus. He was a Jew. But he at least acknowledged there is a creator. And... Uh, a universe with a beginning requires a beginner, making it impossible to reconcile with atheism or pantheism while pointing most naturally to the God of the Bible. The initial reaction of the scientific community was typified by Arthur Eddington, who was one of uh, Einstein's contemporary uh, scientists. His admission, quote, 
Philosophically, the notion of a beginning of the present order of nature is repugnant to me. In other words, he didn't want to admit there is a God who made all this. The universe was expanding and gradually decelerating precisely as Einstein's general theory of relativity had predicted. The scientific community gradually made a 180 degree turn from viewing the universe as infinitely old to realization that an expanding universe required a beginning. Only after Einstein had seen Hubble's evidence for an expanding universe, and after he had looked through Hubble's 100-inch telescope for himself, he was skeptical. He had to see it for himself. Did he formally renounce his cosmological fudge factor? Later, he wrote that its addition to his equations had been, quote, the biggest blunder of my life. After this, Einstein wrote not only of the necessity of a beginning, but of his desire, quote, now listen to this, to know how God created the world. I am not interested in this or that phenomenon, in the spectrum of this or that element. I want to know his thought. The rest are details. <clears throat> Logic demands a cause for every effect. Isaiah directed us to lift our eyes to the heavens and ask the universal question, who created all these? Isaiah 40, 26. Sometimes I think that I go out a lot and look at the stars. I, I don't ask that question, who did? I know who did. But it's just it's awe-inspiring to think of how vast it is and how he made it out of nothing. The Bible says that when we look into the heavens, we find a self-evident truth there, as obvious as if we could hear it in words, Psalm 19.4, available to people of every language, to every part of the earth, and we're without excuse if we don't believe it. The Creator must exist outside of time. Nothing in the universe can go back before the creation event, but the Creator must if He started the process. From our perspective, he is without beginning or end. And from his perspective, outside of time, beginnings and endings are meaningless. He simply is. I can't explain that. You can't either. I can accept it. It's way better than believing there was nothing and nothing exploded and became everything. In the Hebrew Bible, God describes himself as I am. Exodus 3.14 in the New Testament, Jesus said, Before Abraham was, I am. John 8, 58. Notice how Jesus breaks our rules of grammatical tenses in order to express not only the divine name, but his timelessness. And if you remember, as soon as he said that, they picked up stones to stone him because they knew what he was saying. He was saying, I'm God. And they didn't like it. Science has yet to come up with a natural explanation for the universe's origin. And it would seem that the supernatural explanation given in Hebrews 11.3 is still the best one we have. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Isn't that interesting? Molecules, atoms, can't see them. He's talking about it right there. 2,000 years ago. And I love this quote from Robert Jastrow, who was, in a, he was an agnostic. He wasn't necessarily an atheist, but he, he basically said there's no proof for God. And he said, For the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak. As he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. <laughs> they admit, but they're still seeking a solution. There's got to be another way. There's got to be somehow that the universe birthed itself. And that shows you in Romans when we were reading about professing to be wise, they became fools. There's, their foolish heart was darkened. The first law of thermodynamics says, it's also called the uh, law of conservation of mass and energy. It states that matter and energy can be neither created nor destroyed. 
That law has never been broken. But neither mass nor energy can appear from nothing unless you're God. That's the only exception. Concerning the first law of thermodynamics, Isaac Asimov wrote, This law is considered the most powerful and most fundamental generalization about the universe that scientists have ever been able to make. And then there's the second law. The second law tells us that contents of our universe are becoming less ordered and more random. Left to themselves, things become disorganized. Things wear out. Ask any homeowner or car owner, name it. For even though the first law says that energy cannot be destroyed, the second law says that it does degrade so that as energy radiates, less of it is available for mechanical work. And so the universe is wearing down. Thus we know that the universe cannot be eternal. It could not have been dissipating forever. If it had been eternally dissipating, it would have run down long ago, beyond the point where we'd have stars shining. Working backwards, the law clearly points to a beginning. In fact, it points not only to a beginning, but to a highly ordered beginning. This raises the obvious question. If the universe is becoming less ordered, where did the initial order come from? Physicists have long been asking this question and have had no success in finding a natural solution. I love to read about the Big Bang Theory, and that's, they're still, most are relying on that for that's the best thing we've got. And you think to yourself, okay, this colossal explosion of, of the primordial atom, they call it, which again begs the question, where'd the primordial atom come from? They don't want to answer that, because they can't. But you think about this explosion. Have you ever seen an explosion of anything that created order? I think I'll blow up this pile of lumber, bricks, and glass, and I think it'll come down as a finished house. Ridiculous, right? But that's, that's what we're told to believe. And they teach it as science and fact in our schools. And we get intimidated by it because we don't dig in any further to find out that this is garbage. I don't understand everything about God. Nobody does. Why he does some of the things he does. It's his rules, his universe. But I know what he wrote, and I can continue seeking him and finding. And I believe he gives progressive revelation. You find things, and he'll reveal stuff in your life. It talks in Scripture about uh, gold being refined. We're like gold. And you think about it. I don't know a lot about refining, but I've read about it, where gold has impurities. might look great, but as they heat it, all of a sudden some stuff comes to the surface. That doesn't look very good. What do they do? They skim it off. God does the same thing with us, or at least he wants to. <laughs> Sometimes we make excuses. Oh, that's not so bad. If we're honest with him, we're going to see that and say, I want to be like you. Um, it is significant to note that two and a half thousand years before the birth of modern science, when the brightest thinkers were confident that the universe was unchangeable, according to all that they could observe, the Bible writers were in full agreement with the idea that the universe is wearing out. The heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like clothing, you will change them, and they will be discarded. Psalm 102, 25 and 26, and also Isaiah 34, 4 and Isaiah 51, 6. <clears throat> I love this one. Fred Hoyle and his colleague Chandra something, Wick Ren Samach, he's an Indian guy, <clears throat> anyway, calculated the odds that all the functional proteins necessary for life might form in one place by random events. Now, Fred Hoyle was, he's probably gone by now because this was a long time ago, but anyway, he was an astronomer. He was an atheist. But more and more he began looking at chances and stuff, and, and he, they came up with a figure. This is the chance for functional proteins necessary for life forming in one place. Chances are 10 to the 40,000th power, okay? That says that's a one with 40,000 zeros behind it, a number obviously nobody knows. It's beyond, and, and I don't know how they arrived at this, but it says since there are only about 10 to the 80th power atoms in the entire universe, that's a 10 with 80 zeros. The physicists concluded that 
This was an outrageously small probability that could not be faced even if the whole universe consisted of organic soup. But I, I go beyond that. I say, where did the proteins come from? We're giving them the proteins. Where did they come from? Burst out of nothingness. Is that logical? So they come up with theories, trying to their best to explain, and, and they just they work themselves further into a corner and make themselves look more ridiculous. Fred Hoyle, Thomas Gold, Leslie Orgel, Swedish physicist Svante Arrhenius. You don't see many children named Svante in, anymore. Who, coined, who first coined the word panspermia, meaning seeds everywhere. And Nobel Prize winner Francis Crick, who first broke the DNA code, hold to varying versions of panspermia. All have concluded that natural processes alone cannot explain the specified complexities they have studied, whether in protein formation or in the encoded information of DNA. All have been forced by their own discoveries to conclude that life on Earth is far too improbable to appear here with a lot of help from outside. Gold claimed that life must have been sent here in a spaceship from a dying civilization, and that perhaps just the astronauts' bacteria survived the journey. Crick and his colleague Leslie Orgel proposed that just the genetic material was sent in the first place, aimed specifically at this perfect planet called directed panspermia. The other guys have sim simplified the hypothesis still further, saying that the genetic material is being sent all over the universe without a spaceship. The genes simply ride the stellar winds at thousands of kilometers per second, taking root wherever a planet offers the right conditions. Of course, the panspermia hypothesis only begs the question of how life originally began. If natural laws cannot explain how life began on this ideal planet, how can they explain the formation of life at any location? They're desperate. The fact that respected scientists, among them Nobel laureates and discoverers of nature's constants, should have to resort to speculations as wild as panspermia give us a good indication of how difficult it is to explain the formation of life's building blocks by any earthbound natural process. Which takes more faith to believe? That design points to some means by which humans created themselves? Or that design points to an infinite number of universes that somehow sprang out of nothing? Or that design points to a transcendent creator. These are our alternatives. You know what I think atheists' biggest problem is? I think they, they say to themselves, if there is a God, then he wouldn't let this happen, he wouldn't let this happen, I would do this. And because they don't observe it, then they, because he doesn't manifest himself in the way that they think, where, well, I should be able to see him, I should be able to hear him. And you know what? He did let people see him. When he came in the form of a baby, Jesus came, lived a sinless life, and what did we do? Humanity, I'm speaking. We killed him. But thankfully, that was in the plan, because he didn't stay dead. He died for you. He died for me. The world is a sick place. You don't have to look very far to, to see how twisted and horrible it is. You know, we've advanced technologically, but you look at what's going on in the world, and it isn't any different than the days of Lot, days of Noah, which Jesus said just before his return. He said it's going to be just like the days of Lot, just like the days of Noah. If our universe came about by some strange fluke and there is nothing outside of it, no purposeful creator beyond its time and space to value it or give it meaning, then it must remain without meaning. The universe can't generate its own meaning or value any more than a rare rock sitting on an uninhabited planet can ever be valuable sitting there all by itself. And then it talks about moral values. Of course, most non-theists will argue that they certainly can have moral values apart from the theist standards of reference. For those who take the blind chance position and still wish to hold to some system of ethics, they must admit that right and wrong are determined, if not by God, then by people who may differ over what is right and what is wrong. One person's right might be another person's wrong. To slaughter six million Jews 
may be terribly wrong to most, but right and consistent with the worldview of Adolf Hitler, who is to say what's actually wrong. Here the blind chance position begins its run down a blind alley, for when its proponents try to claim that there is a better standard than individuals, and yet they must avoid anything too much like an objective godlike standard, they will usually settle on a sensible intermediate like society. But society has at times upheld racism, slavery, even human sacrifice. If the blind chance proponent says that society was obviously wrong in those particular instances, we must ask, wrong relative to what? By using that word, the materialist acknowledges that there must be a higher standard by which to judge. And I'm going to read you a quote from uh, the great theologian Woody Allen. <laughs> um, I'm not positive. I think he's an atheist. I, I'm not sure. Uh, at any rate, this, this kind of speaks about him and those like him and their hope of the world, which they have none. He said, More than at any other time in history, mankind faces a crossroads. One path leads to despair and utter hopelessness. The other, to total extinction. Let us pray we have the wisdom to choose correctly. I speak, by the way, not with any sense of futility, but with a panicky conviction of the absolute meaninglessness of existence. I bet he's great at parties. You know, I think of uh, Ernest Hemingway, brilliant writer, and I'm guessing probably had a lot of money. I mean, he did very well, but uh, ended up putting a shotgun in his mouth and blowing his head off because he life was meaningless. Outside of God, life is meaningless. And I'm not saying everybody's going to do that, but many do because they don't find any meaning. There's no, we're just random accidents. And one day we're just going to be snuffed out of existence. No wonder drugs and alcohol and everything are so prevalent. People are trying to numb the pain and they just need to come to him, seek him. He is the answer. God says, try me, try me. He says, let us reason together. Reason, that is logos, the definition literally in Greek is reason. Come, let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, I'll make them white as snow. He just says, try it. One more thing. Why wouldn't a loving God just bring everyone into his kingdom? True love requires mutual choice. If God desired to have an eternal trusting relationship with a people who would willingly return his love, he could not simply create a people filled with love and trust because that would not involve their wills. The very idea of a real will to trust and love requires the real possibility of a person's will being used to distrust and reject. I'm sure God's heart breaks whenever people mock him, whenever they shake their fist in his face. And he created us knowing that was going to happen, but he also knew that millions were going to find him and accept him. And there's always room for one more. So I don't know where you are today. I hope you're on the path. I hope you've been seeking God. I hope you found God and that you're letting him uh, reveal things like gold and, and skimming them off and getting to be more and more like Jesus like we need to do every day. If not, I encourage you to seek God because if you seek him with all your heart, the Bible says you will find him. But if you don't, guess what? You're not going to find him. It's that simple. It's not rocket science. I think I'll leave you with that. Let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for helping me, giving me the ability, because I really don't like to be up front at all or speak in front of people. But I know you have empowered me and I just I thank you for giving us your word. Help us to apply it to our hearts and not be intimidated by the world that loves to mock and ridicule and say we're crazy. And yet when you look at their position and what they have to believe in, 
Essentially, they're believing in magic. And they're, but they're lost. They're lost like, a, like sheep without a shepherd. They're wandering around looking for an answer. And, and I believe very soon the world's going to see the Antichrist. And they're going to follow him, believing Here, here's the one who's going to lead us out of this mess. But he's not. But I believe you are coming back, and I, it could be today. And I pray if anybody here does not know you, that you would knock on the door of their heart, that they would ask you and seek you, because you said, if, if you seek me with all your heart and with all your soul, you will find me. I pray that you'll just be with us as we go throughout this week. Help us to honor you, glorify you in all we say and do. Help us to be more like Jesus each day. Show us, bring those impurities to the surface. Put the heat on us so that we know when something isn't right and we want you to skim it off so we can be more like Jesus. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed.